Tonight we're going to talk about lies in the textbooks. One of my uh, few idiosyncrasies <clears throat> is I collect public school textbooks. I have hundreds of them. I just brought a few with me tonight. Since I taught uh, biology and earth science and physical science for years, it's always been fascinating to me to study these books and see how different people, you know, present the subject. And so we're going to talk about some of the lies in the textbooks. I think one of the most important things uh, in my seminar is this session. Uh, we're going to try to cover a lot more material than normal, though, uh, about what's in these textbooks anyway. I start off in my seminar giving an illustration to, to make the point. I'll give it here so you can uh, see how this fits in perspective. It has always amazed me, after teaching school for 15 years, how two people can look at the same thing and come to opposite conclusions of what they're seeing. Two people look at Grand Canyon. They're both looking at the same canyon. And one of them says, Wow, look what the Colorado River did for millions and millions of years. The Bible-believing Christian stands there, looks at the same canyon, and says, Wow, look what the flood did in about 30 minutes. It's just a matter of how you want to look at it. Same canyon, two different ways to look at it. Textbook says, over millions of years, the Colorado River has carved the Grand Canyon from solid rock. Now, just hold on a second. Does he know that or does he think that? He doesn't know that. He thinks it took millions of years to form the Grand Canyon. I do debates all the time. Last night on the show, we are on the radio all night long until 4 in the morning. Several of the folks that called in were talking about, oh, Grand Canyon took millions of years to form. No, it didn't take millions of years to form. I tell them in the debates, this one professor said, Obviously, Mr. Holvin, it took millions of years to make the Grand Canyon. I said, well, sir, did you know if you built a dam across Grand Canyon, a huge lake would fill in behind it, covering several states. I mean, it would be a gigantic lake. Of course, it would take a lot of dirt to fill in the canyon, but still, it would take a, make, back up a giant lake behind it. This uh, picture with the white shows, that's what's called the snow line. Between these two red lines is what's called the Kaibab uplift. Now, Grand Canyon, it cuts right across the middle of a ridge, uh, sort of like a long, narrow mountain called a ridge. If you push the carpet up against the wall, it would wrinkle. That would make a ridge. Grand Canyon is a slice right across a ridge called the Kaibab Uplift. K-I-K-A-I-B-A-B, uh, Kaibab. The top of the Kaibab Uplift, that ridge, is roughly seven or 8,000 feet above sea level. Way up there. Now, the bottom of the canyon where the river is is only 1,800 feet above sea level, so it's more than one mile deep. Absolutely gigantic canyon. How many of you have ever seen the Grand Canyon? Huge hole in the ground. Unbelievable. 100 and some, 180 or 200 miles long between those two red lines. This is a picture from a satellite. Um, the river enters the canyon up at the far right corner at 2,800 feet above sea level. And the river flows down to the bottom and left is the way it would flow in this, in, from this angle here. So what we have here, as the river enters the canyon, it flows downhill, of course, and ends up at 1,800 feet above sea level. It drops about 1,000 feet. During that time, the ground is rising up. The Kaibab uplift is going uphill. Interesting. So I told this professor in this debate one time, I said, Sir, did you know uh, the top of the canyon is higher than the bottom? He said, yeah. I said, did you know the river only runs through the bottom? He said, so? I said, sir, the top of the canyon is higher than where the river enters the canyon, but over 4,000 feet. Rivers don't flow uphill. There's no delta. Where's all the mud that washed out of there? Usually when a river cuts through, you know, makes a canyon or something, and all the mud that washes out is out at the outside. It flattens out into a delta. No delta for the Grand Canyon. There's no way that river made that canyon. The flood made Grand Canyon. Probably in a few weeks. Certainly not millions of years. See, while the sediment layers were soft after the flood, the water could erode that very quickly. Probably Grand Canyon formed within a few years after the flood, because the Bible says in Psalm 104, the mountains arose, the valley sank down, and the water rushed off. During this time, probably huge lakes were trapped by the mountains lifting up, and it would take several weeks or months or years for that lake to overflow its own, find the lowest point and overflow and make a spillway, and carve out Grand Canyon very quickly. Most of the river basins in the world were probably formed as the flood water ran off 
during the last few months of the flood or during the first few years afterwards. There would be drainage patterns would have to be established, and as the water soaks out of the ground, you know, it, gradually the ground would dry out and form the mountains and the rock layers that we have today. Okay, the um, Grand Canyon is at what we call a washed-out spillway. Have you ever seen a farmer built a you know, dam on his property like Grandpa has on his property up there in Arkansas? If the water goes over the top of the dam, it'll find the lowest point and start you know, going over that spot. Once it starts going through, it cuts a little groove, and then more water's rushing through, so it cuts the groove deeper and wider, so more water comes through. Especially if you have a lot of debris like sand and gravel and rocks and tree stumps and trees, it becomes like liquid sandpaper. It goes rushing through and carves the canyon out just in a hurry. And we'll get into more of that on video number six of our about the flood, what caused that. Anyway, Grand Canyon is simply a breached dam. It was not formed by the Colorado River. So you need to be able to give for the quiz some reasons why we know the Grand Canyon could not have been formed by the Colorado River. There's no delta. Um, the top is higher than the bottom. Those would be too, uh, too good enough right there. And, but the, the rivers don't flow uphill. <clears throat> okay. Does anybody know what this machine is, this farmer's holding? This is a calf puller. It's a come along, a block and tackle, or come along attached to a pole. Once in a while, a cow has a hard time having that baby calf, and so they get the calf puller out, hook the cable around the calf's legs, and <coughs> jack the calf out of the cow. You get a few thousand pounds of pressure on there, that calf comes right out, no problem. <laughs> Well, one day this farmer was out pulling a calf with a calf puller. It was a breech birth. That means the back feet were coming out first. That's not good. Normally calves are born head first. But this one, the back feet are coming out first. So the farmer had the calf puller out there and had the cable wrapped around the calf's back legs, and he's trying to pull the calf out of the cow. And a city fellow stopped his car to see what on earth is going on. And the farmer said, come here, man, I need some help. He said, I don't know nothing about cows. He said, just come give me a hand, would you? He said, okay. So the city fellow hopped out of the car jumped over and helped the farmer pull the calf. He never said a word. He just did what he was told. Well, about 10 minutes later, you know, the calf is fine and the mother's fine, and so they're walking up to the barn, going to get washed up, and the farmer said, uh, Matt, I want to thank you for helping me. The city fellow said, oh, I was glad to help, glad to help. The farmer said, uh, have you ever seen anything like this before? The city fellow said, no, sir, I've never seen nothing like this. The farmer said, well, uh, do you have any questions? He said, yes, sir. I got one question. It's been bugging me for 10 minutes. The farmer said, well, what's your question? The city fellow said, how fast do you figure that calf was going when it ran into that cow? <laughs> no, 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 fella. We are not separating the wreck here. Uh, how fast was that calf going? You know, two people looking at the same thing, and one of them's getting a the wrong idea of what's going on. Well, the Bible warned us that was going to happen in 2 Peter chapter 3. It says, knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers. There are people that scoff at the Bible. And it says they're going to walk after their own lust, and they're going to say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Now, that's an important verse. We don't ask you to memorize too many verses for our class here, but I want you to memorize 2 Peter 3.3. 3, 3, 4, and 3, 5. And we'll uh, put those on the test here. 2 Peter 3, 3, 3, 4, and 3, 5. 3, 4 says, the scoffers are going to say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were. That's a very important phrase. What that means is, the scoffers are going to say, you know, the way things are happening now is the way they've always been happening. For instance, they look at Grand Canyon, big old huge slice in the rock, and they notice the river running across the bottom is, is eating rocks off the bottom. It's eroding it, making it deeper. So they study the canyon for 20 years and say, you know, we calculated over a 20-year span that the Grand Canyon gets deeper about an eighth of an inch every year. The rock is being worn off. That's probably true. I wouldn't argue about that. And they'll say, see, this canyon is, you know, 6,000 feet deep and an eighth of an inch a year. That proves it's, you know, X number zillion years old. <laughs> Hold it. You're assuming that what you're watching now, eighth of an inch per year, is what's always happened. Right there is the faulty assumption. 99% of that canyon was formed in a couple days, and the last 1% has been happening over the last 4,400 years since the flood. But they assume what we see today is, what we've all, is the way it's always been happening down through history. That is called uniformitarianism, which will be a word you need to know. 
We'll get into that in a second. I'll put it up on the board here. The scoffers, the Bible says, will be willingly ignorant of how God made the heavens and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. We covered that in the previous sessions about what the original creation was like, how that the earth was made with a canopy of water overhead, and it was in the water and out of the water. And the scoffers are ignorant of the flood, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. This world was destroyed by a flood. And the scoffers don't want to admit there was a flood because that means, you know, God has the authority to judge his creation. And he does, folks. This is his world. He can wreck it if he wants. Well, one of the scoffers in the last days was a fellow named James Hutton. In just about every science book, you read something about James Hutton. He lived in the late 1700s. He wrote a book in 1795 where he said, I think the earth is much older than everybody says. Now, you need to understand the history here. In the late 1700s, of course, we had our American Revolution. The English call it the Rebellion. Uh, we had our revolution in 1776 and rebelled against, you know, King George, threw the tea in the harbor, making it unsuitable even for the British to drink. And in 1795, James Hutton wrote his book and said, I think the earth is millions of years old. Now, during this time, almost everybody in America, at least, and in the Western world, believed the Bible. They were strongly influenced by Christianity. And most everybody believed the earth was about 6,000 years old. So James Hutton comes along and says, I think it's, you know, millions, millions of years old. Well, that was a pretty new thought, and not many folks believed it. Also, during this time of the end of the 1700s and early 1800s, there were many revolutions going on. There were uh, countries rebelling against the idea of a monarchy, a king. We had the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Spanish, the Polish, the Italian, the German. What was happening was people were throwing off the king as a form of government. Now, the czar in Russia was the equivalent to a king up until 1917, right? Russia kind of escaped this. They kept their monarchy intact you know, long after the uh, European revolutions were going on. But many countries were having revolutions to get rid of the king. They thought like, you know, we ought to have a different form of government called a democracy. And here the Bible says you should honor the king. And so some people thought the Bible was an obstacle to their political objectives. So, like this textbook says, only a few, the, many people thought the earth was only a few thousand years old. <clears throat> But in the 1700s, a Scottish scientist named James Hutton estimated the earth was much older. He used the principle of uniformitarianism. There's the word you need to know. Uniformitarianism means the way things are happening now is the way they've always been happening. The slogan is often put like this, the present is the key to the past. And that's what they say. Uniformitarian means the present is the key to the past. In other words, if Grand Canyon is getting deeper a little bit every year, well, then that's the way it's always been happening. Actually, the Bible is the only reliable key to the past. But one of these uh, scoffers, James Hutton, wrote his book, and he kind of developed this idea of uniformitarianism. Now, a young lawyer from Scotland named Charles Lyell read that book and became very influenced by it. Charles Lyell, and you need to know his name, Charles Lyell, the Scottish lawyer, hated the Bible. He lived in the early 1800s. He read James Hutton's book and was influenced by it. Charles Lyell wrote this book, Principles of Geology. I've got all three volumes of his all thoroughly marked up in my library. But uh, in this book, written in 1830, Charles Lyell is the primary fellow responsible for developing what is called the geologic column. And in his book, he mocks scripture. Now, you have to understand, during the early 1800s, most people believed the Bible, so you had to be careful if you were going to attack the Bible. You didn't just come out and blast it like the atheist did last night on the radio program, you know, and the calls you got last night, Marlissa, on the, the skeptics calling in saying, oh, you're so stupid to believe the Bible. Back in 1800, man, you didn't do that, because, you know, 99% of the population believed the Bible. So you would uh, blast Christians, and you wouldn't have any friends left. So the way he did it was interesting. He used uh, scoffing uh, to scoff at the Scripture. For instance, on page 30, he said, They reach false conclusions and futile reasoning and ancient doctrines sanctioned by the implicit faith of many generations and supposed to rest on scriptural authority. This is a backhanded way of poking fun at the Scriptures for those idiots who dare to believe the Bible. He said on page 41, uh, this other guy remarked how much the interests of religion, now watch this phrase carefully, the interests of religion as well as those of sound philosophy had suffered. In other words, religion and sound philosophy suffer when you mix them together. What's he trying to say here? 
You mean you can't have religion and believe the Bible and also have sound philosophy? That's what he's trying to imply by perpetually mixing up the sacred writings with questions in physical science. Here is where, and they do this today, <clears throat> they try to make it look like the Bible and science cannot be put together. Well, no, the Bible and science get along fine. The Bible and evolution do not get along fine. But by saying the Bible and science don't get along, they're trying to imply that evolution is part of science, and it's not. Uh, 41, he reasoned uh, philosophically against those who regarded the disordered state of Earth's crust as exhibiting signs of the wrath of God for the sins of man. And, of course, if you look at the world from a biblical perspective, you see the flood in the Bible, and you look at the Grand Canyon, you say, wow, that's the wrath of God for the sins of man. But some people don't want you to look at the world and see the wrath of God for man's sin because then you might end up getting saved. And so the devil has got a lot of folks looking at Grand Canyon saying, wow, that took millions of years of evolution. And that way they miss an important object lesson to remind them of the wrath of God on the sins of man. So Lyle here is mocking this idea. He talked about religious prejudices. You know, if you believe the Bible, you're, you're, you're prejudiced. Uh, he said, men of superior talent, he's uh, talking about himself, <clears throat> who thought for themselves... Now, what do you mean by this? If you think for yourself, you will be of superior talent. And he said, and they were not blinded by authority like the Bible. This is another one of those backhanded jabs trying to say, well, if you believe the Bible, you don't know how to think for yourself. And I get that every week in debates and in call-in talk shows and stuff with us. Oh, you believe the Bible, you don't know how to think for yourself, huh? Well, yes, I do know how to think for myself. And I think I've studied it very carefully, and the Bible is absolutely right. <laughs> Simple as that. Okay. Uh, Lyle said his goal was to free the science from Moses. What's he mean by that, you think? Most scientists in this time were Christians. They thought science got along just fine with the Bible. Lyle said he wanted to free science from Moses. In other words, you know, get rid of this idea of a flood and a creation. Let's put millions of years in here. That's what Lyle wanted to do. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Scientists who thought that Archbishop Usher's estimate, or even ten times this was an immense length of time, were in for a rude shock when they started looking closely at the solid part of the earth. Oh, there's another backhanded stab at the Bible. In other words, yeah, you might believe the Bible's true, but when you really look at science, you'll find out it's not. And there are professors today that do the same thing to their students. They're going to say, oh, you believe the Bible? Huh? Well, by the time you get done with this class, we'll show you the truth. That's just the attitude they have. That science doesn't go along with uh, Scripture, but it certainly does. Lyle, in the early 1800s, developed, well, along with some other fellows, he developed the geologic column. How many have ever heard of the geologic column before? This was the time when they divided the earth up into layers, you know, Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Archaeozoic, and all this stuff. They further divided it into uh, different periods like the Jurassic, the uh, Cretaceous, Jurassic, Triassic. Each of these names... Most of these names comes from a section in England, like the Devonian, for instance. There's a Devonshire, England. I believe it's called Devonshire, and they named it after that section. Most of the names come from a section of England where they were digging around, finding these layers of, you know, chalk or something. Cretaceous, Cretia, means Latin for chalk. And so they find a layer of chalk, and they call that the Chalk Age, the Cretaceous Age. I don't know what the rest of them mean, but you can look it up in any dictionary. But each of these... <clears throat> Layers was assigned during this 1800s a name, an age, and an index fossil. How many saw the movie Jurassic Park, named after the Jurassic layer? Did they have that in Ukraine, Jurassic Park movie? Did you see this? No? Oh, scary movie. Did you see it, Tanya? You haven't seen it either? I think we have it. You can take it home and watch it. You'd enjoy that. Uh, the Layers, then, were assigned an age and a name and an index fossil. Now, this is very important. This was all done during the early 1800s. This geologic column is the Bible for the evolutionist. It can only be found one place in the world. The only place you can find the geologic column is in the textbooks. In the textbooks, they talk about, here's an earth science textbook, about how, you know, during the Cenozoic and Mesozoic and Paleozoic era, they've got it all figured out like, wow, this is, you know, millions of years old. And it's just simple baloney. The geologic column cannot be found in the world. Most places are missing about 70% of the geologic column. No place in the world contains all the geologic column in, in the right order. Now, one professor I debated said, 
Mr. Oven, we've got 26 places where we found the geologic column in order. I said, no, what you mean is you've got 26 places where you found the fossils in order that you expected. That's all. This textbook admits if there were a column of sediments, unfortunately, no such column exists. There is no geologic column. So that'll be a quiz, quiz question. Where can you find the geologic column? In the textbook. The only place it exists. Now, it is true the Earth has many layers. That's not the question. I've been to Grand Canyon and Royal Gorge. And remember Royal Gorge? We fired the airplane off of there, <laughs> flew down for about four miles. Uh, I've been to lots of these canyons, been to all 50 states now, and I've been to Snake River Valley in Idaho a couple months ago. There's no question the Earth has layers. The question is, how did it get that way? I want you to look at these layers in Grand Canyon and answer this question. If each of these layers is a different age, don't you think there'd be some erosion marks in between the layers? I mean, if the top layer sat there for four million years waiting for the next one, why aren't there some erosion marks in between the layers? So one of the quiz questions will be, how are, what are some ways to show that the layers of Earth are not vastly different in ages? How do we know those two layers right on top of each other are not millions of years apart, even though the textbook says they are? Well, one way we know is there are no erosion marks between them. Another way we know is we find polystrata fossils. Poly means many, P-O-L-Y. Strata, S-T-R-T-A, S-T-R-A-T-A. Polystrata fossils are fossils that run through many different layers. And I'll show you pictures of those in just a minute. See, the layers were really formed during the flood. If you take a jar of dirt and shake it up, put some water in it, shake it up and set it down, it'll settle out just like this. You get gravel goes to the bottom, and then sand, and then silt, and then clay. And then very slowly, the fine particles end up on top because they're going to float around in the water for hours until they finally land. During the flood of Noah, you get the very same sorting process. We get into lots more on that on video number six. I was preaching in Union Center, South Dakota years ago. Marlissa, you would have been about 10 12 years, that's right, 12 years old. Um, Union Center is right there. You can't even find it on the map. <laughs> 40 people in the whole town. 38 of them came to church. Uh, we had a revival, man, <laughs> turned up the whole town. I don't know where the other two were. I'm pulling a calf, I, I bet. But uh, the preacher said, hey, Brother Hovind, let's go down to Rapid City, South Dakota. They've got a museum there with a bunch of dinosaur bones in it. I said, all right, man, I like dinosaurs, so let's go. So we all piled in the cars and vans, and we drove down to Rapid City, South Dakota. We got down to this museum. It's called the School of Mines Museum in Rapid City, South Dakota. We walk in the door, and this older fellow met us, and he says, uh, Folks, would you like me to give you a tour? I'm a guide here. We said, Sure, that'd be great. The first place we stopped on the tour was the geologic time scale. They've got this chart all lit up behind glass. We stopped and we stood by that chart for a while. He said, Now, folks, this layer of rock right here is about 70 million years old. My daughter, Marlissa, said, Sir, how do you know that layer is 70 million years old? He said, well, that's a good question, honey. We determine the age of the layers by the types of fossils they contain. They're called index fossils, and this layer had dinosaur bones in it, so it must be 70 million years old. She said, okay, thank you, sir. We walked around the other side. We're standing over here, and the guide said, now, folks, uh, these bones right here are about 100 million years old. My daughter raised her hand again. She said, sir, how do you know how old those bones are? He said, that's a good question, honey. We determine the age of the bones by which layer they come from. She said, uh, excuse me, sir, when we were standing on the other side, you told me you knew the age of the layers by the bones, and now you're telling me you know the age of the bones by the layers. She said, uh, isn't that circular reasoning? <laughs> I thought, wow, a chip off the old block. That guy had the strangest look on his face. It was almost as if he were thinking. He looked at me. I wasn't about to help him. He looked at my daughter. He said, you know, you're right. That is circular reasoning. He said, I never thought of that before. That poor fellow drove 50 miles one way that night to hear me preach in Union Center, South Dakota. The crowd swelled to 39. We set up a chair in the aisle. Uh, afterwards, we talked for almost an hour. He said, Dr. Hovind, do you, do you mean all this stuff about geology I'm teaching is wrong? He said, I teach this stuff at the college. I said, oh, no, no, sir, I like geology. You've learned the names of all the minerals. Man, just that's a good trick, folks. There's 1,200 different minerals. Some have names about that long. Um, you've learned the hardness test, the Rockwell test, the scratch test. I said, no, sir, that's all good. And by the way, 
if you're going to speak or do something on creation science, you need to learn some basic geology. For instance, different minerals have different hardnesses. Talc is the softest. It's the softest mineral there is. As a matter of fact, it's so soft, you can grind it up and make powder out of it. Anybody know what they call it when you do that? Talcum powder, right. The hardest one is which one? Hardest mineral, diamond. I don't have a diamond, or I'd show you, but diamond is hardness of 10. Talc is hardness of 1. Everything in between has a number between 1 and 10, obviously. For instance, your fingernail is about a 3. So with your fingernail, you could scratch talc. You couldn't scratch a diamond. A diamond would scratch your fingernail because it's harder. Whichever one scratches the other one, that's the hardest one. So, uh, for instance, a, a pocket knife is a hardness, can you read that, about a 5.5? So, a pocket knife, its hardness of 5.5, will scratch a penny, which is a hardness of 3. Copper is, uh, that's how hard it is, they rate it 1 to 10. Whereas a diamond would scratch a pocket knife, because the diamond is harder. And that's the hardness scale, it's called. Um, this is one of the tests they use to determine if you find a mineral, you say, what is it? Well, one thing is to find out the hardness. Another is find out the density, you know, the, how, how compact it is and stuff like that. Doesn't matter. Anyway, there's a lot of different minerals. So this professor, I said, no, sir, you've learned a lot of good things about geology. You've learned the names of all the minerals, the hardness test, all this. I said, yes, sir, that's all good. No problem there. But as far as the layers being different ages, I said, yes, sir, it's all baloney. Those layers are not different ages. It's all based on what we call circular reasoning. Let me cover this real quick and we'll take a break. Circular reasoning. This uh, fellow said in early, about 1830, Charles Lyell, some other guys, independently developed a biostratigraphic technique. That's a fancy word for a geologic column. For dating Cenozoic deposits based on, watch this, they dated the deposits based on the proportions of living and extinct species of mollusk shells. So if you find some clam shells in a layer of rock, you would say, oh, you know, to change from this kind of clam to this kind of clam would take millions of years, so this must be millions of years older than this one. They start off with the assumption that evolution happened and that the clams slowly changed from one kind to another, and then they dated the layers based upon the clam shells found in those layers. The article continues, uh, strangely, little effort has been made to test this assumption. This leaves failure leaves the method vulnerable to circularity. In other words, circular reasoning. Use one to prove the other. Back and forth. Here's a textbook, page 306, they say. You should date the rocks by the fossils. Look what it says in yellow. The layers of rock can be dated by the types of fossils they contain. Now, what does that say? You date the rocks by the fossils. On the next page, it said, scientists have determined the relative times of appearance and disappearance of many kinds of organisms from the locations of their fossils in rock sedimentary rock layers. Ooh, now they're telling us that you date the fossils by the rocks. On the last page, they told us to date the rocks by the fossils, and now you date the fossils by the rocks. It is circular reasoning. The intelligent layman has long suspected circular reasoning in the use of rocks to date fossils and fossils to date rocks. The geologist has never bothered to think of a good reply, feeling the explanations are not worth the trouble as long as the work brings results. This guy said, it cannot be denied from a strictly philosophical standpoint that geologists are here arguing in a circle. The succession of organisms has been determined by a study of their remains embedded in the rocks, and the relative ages of the rocks are determined by the remains of the organisms that they contain. Even Encyclopedia Botanica can figure it out. It's circular argument. Use one to prove the other. Ever since William Smith at the beginning of the 19th century, fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of correlating and dating the rocks in which they occur. Apart from very modern examples, which really are archaeology, by the way, it's a good time to point out, uh, archaeology is dealing with the past few thousand years. If you're going to dig up an Indian civilization, that you're an archaeologist. Whereas if you want to get into... Uh, anthropology, the study of ancient things, then they, that would be an anthropologist, which is mostly an art form, not a science. Uh, that's study of things that are supposed to be millions of years old. Okay. He, this guy said, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. That's an interesting uh, quote here. In other words, they don't date fossils by their carbon dating or potassium argon dating. They date them by the geologic position. Which layer did you find it in? Oh, well, then it's so many million years old. We'll get into a few more quotes on uh, 
circular reasoning right after the break and then talk show you some of the polystrata fossils that have been found right after our break. All right, let's talk some more about um, circular reasoning and how the geologic column is tied in. This uh, author said, radiometric dating would not have been feasible if the geologic column had not been erected first. What he means by this is, you can't tell the age of a fossil with radioactive dating, like carbon dating. You must first know the approximate age from the geologic column, which is why they generally will not date, unless you trick them into doing it, they won't date dinosaur bones with carbon dating because they assume dinosaurs lived 70 million years ago and carbon dating only goes back 30 or 40,000 years and so they won't even do it. But when they do date dinosaur bones with carbon dating, it comes back 20, 25,000 years old. Not millions of years old. Okay. This, uh, Niles Eldridge is um, director of the American Museum of Natural History in uh, New York, a strong believer in evolution. He spoke at uh, University of West Florida. I went and heard him speak. Uh, he said, paleontologists cannot operate this way. There is no way simply to look at a fossil and say how old it is unless you know the age of the rocks it comes from. What's he saying there? You find a fossil, you have to know how old the layer of rock is. He said, and this poses something of a problem. If we date the rocks by their fossils, which is how it's done, how can we then turn around and talk about patterns of evolutionary change through time in the fossil record? Again, he's admitting circular reasoning. I like this one. Uh, the rocks do date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. <laughs> I don't see how they can't see this. Stratigraphy cannot avoid this kind of reasoning if it insists on using only temporal concepts because circularity is inherent in the derivation of time scales. This guy said, the charge of circular reasoning can be handled several ways. It can be ignored as not the proper concern of the public. In other words, you can say, well, it's none of your business how we date the rocks. We know what we're doing. We're the professionals. It can be denied by calling down the law of evolution. It can be admitted as a common practice, or it can be avoided by pragmatic reasoning. But I'm telling you, it is based on circular reasoning. This uh, Larry Azar said, are the authorities maintaining on the one hand that evolution is documented by geology and on the other that geology is documented by evolution? Isn't this a circular argument? I like the name of the article. Biologists, help. <laughs> you need some help, all right. I like to ask evolutionists the question. I say, now, fellas, your geologic column contains limestone, sandstone, shale, sandstone, limestone. You know, limestone is scattered throughout there several times. Limestone is used as a building block. You can see me by a big brick building up in Indiana made out of limestone. It's a pretty hard rock, not quite as hard as, you know, concrete, but just about as close. Limestone is obviously made from what's called a sedimentary rock. That means it was, it was deposited out of water. It's made from sediment. Like if mud, if the bottom of a mud puddle hardened into a rock, that would be sedimentary rock made from sediments. Limestone is obviously, as a matter of fact, the whole geologic column is made of sedimentary rock. Um, I like to ask him the question, how do you tell the difference between 100 million year old limestone and 600 million year old limestone? If I handed you a piece of limestone and said, how old is it? How would you know? They're both limestone, same kind of rock. Well, there's only one way they can tell the difference. That is by the index fossils. If your limestone contains a dinosaur bone, well, then it's 70 million year old Jurassic limestone. However, if it contains a trilobite, it's going to be 600 million year old Cambrian limestone. They date the rocks based on the fossils they find in it. Here's a trilobite. I've got a bunch of them in my office there. This textbook says, uh, matter of fact, my textbook might be right here. If not, it's in my office there. Okay. He says, uh, trilobite fossils make good index fossils. If a trilobite, such as this one, is found in a rock layer, the rock layer was probably formed 500 to 600 million years ago. Okay, now why do they think trilobites indicate the rock is 500 million years old? Well, because they started with the assumption that trilobites evolved first. See, the oldest life form, according to their thinking, is supposed to be 600 million years old. Well, if trilobites came first, we have a real problem. Here's a human shoe print where a guy has stepped on a trilobite. Now, according to their thinking, 
Humans didn't get here till 3 million years ago. They didn't start wearing shoes till about 10,000 years ago. So how can you have a human shoe print on top of a trilobite? Now, some have tried to argue that this is not a shoe print. It's a natural break in the shale. This, this kind of rock called shale uh, splits very easily. And they say, this is just a natural break. That's not really a shoe print. Well, Mr. Meister from uh, Carnes, Utah, who found it, uh, took it to quite a few geologists. The, uh, Dr. H.H. H. Do Delling, Dorling of Utah's Geological Survey certified it is not a fake. Reader's Digest, Mr. De Unexplained, talks about this. A human shoe print smashed on top of a trilobite, on top of a smashed trilobite, would indicate trilobites and humans lived at the same time. Which I could have told them. The Bible says God made everything in six days. Some people say maybe aliens visited the planet. And that's what happened. You know, 600 million years ago, aliens came down here. One guy said maybe a large trilobite shaped like a shoe fell on a small one. Well, there are some big trilobites, I'll admit, but they're not shaped like a shoe. Second Peter's got the best explanation. The scoffers in the last days are willingly ignorant of the flood. Probably trilobites dwell at the bottom of the ocean, go through the mud down there or something, and they do have gills for living in water. And probably during the time of the flood, the crust of the earth is flexing back and forth, and what used to be the bottom of the ocean is now above sea level. And people are running across this area trying to find a mountain to keep out of the water. And if somebody stepped on a trilobite, which before had been at the bottom of the ocean. Trilobite eyes are incredibly complicated. This uh, Science News back in 1974 said that trilobite eyes have the most sophisticated eye lenses ever produced by nature. Well, I disagree. They said they were produced by God. But the trilobite eye sometimes will have 1,500 lenses, which means he could actually see all directions at the same time. He can see behind him and see above him and see around him all at the same time. Even uh, Stephen Gould says the eyes of the early trilobites have never been exceeded for complexity or acuity. Well, now, if they're the first animal to evolve, or one of the first, don't you find it kind of interesting? They've got the most complicated eye in the world. There might be some animals like trilobites still alive. I talked to Joe Taylor today at Mount Blanco Museum in Texas. Uh, they've got a great display of fossil trilobites including many that are found in the folded position. What happens when a trilobite dies, it folds up or rolls up. How many have seen the little bugs we have here in Florida? They roll up, like call them a roly-poly. You know, a little, little round milk, a pill bug, they're called. As soon as you touch them, they roll up. looks like a little BB. You know what I'm talking about, the little gray things? Yeah, called a pill bug. Trilobites do that also. When they get scared, they roll up so their shell protects them on all sides. Many trilobites are found fossilized flattened out. Some are found fossilized rolled up. Many th millions are found fossilized halfway. They started to roll up and died. Now think about it. Mount Blanco Museum has a display of trilobites where there's two of them that are laid out flat like they're walking. The one in front of them is halfway rolled up. Something caught them in, in a, a catastrophe happened probably incredible water temperature change during the time of the flood. You'd have the fountains of the great deep breaking open, hot waters rushing into certain areas, killing these animals before they can even think of what's going on. They don't even have time to curl up. They just die in a flattened out position. Um, this rock is called a grap... It contains a fossil called a graptolite. Now, the graptolite is the New York state fossil. Every one of the 50 states has a state bird, a state flower, and a state fossil. Graptolite is from New York, just north of Pennsylvania, Becky. Uh, I don't know what Pennsylvania's fossil is. Would you know that? You live there. You don't know? Okay. Uh, this rock is supposed to be 410 million years old. Now, this means if you find a rock and it contains a graptolite, the professor will date it at being 410 million years old. Not because he knows how old the rock is, but because he knows it contains a graptolite and they're supposed to have lived 410 million years ago. Index fossils determine the age of the rocks. Well, this was all working fine until 1993, when they found graptolites are still alive in the South Pacific. Well, now hold it. If they're still alive, maybe that means they could live in any rock layer. That means they were probably alive a thousand years ago, didn't it? And 5,000, and 10,000, and 50,000. So. 
Maybe all the dating we've done of rock layers based on index fossils is baloney. And it is. Didn't happen. The textbook says, a fish with lobe finned. Now, you'll need to know this one, a lobe finned fish. What that means is it's got a little short arm and then a fin. So what is a lobe finned fish? It'll be a quiz question. That's a fish that has a short arm before the fin attaches to the, to the body. The textbook says lobe finned fish are index fossils for 325 to 410 million year old rock. Well, now, just hold on a minute. Lobe finned fish are still alive. Look at the fins on this fish. This is called a coelacanth. The coelacanth was discovered in 1938. A guy accidentally discovered one at a fish market in Madagascar, I believe. Realized, wow, this is a, this is a coelacanth. A fish that has a little short arm and then the fin grows out. And so they've since found quite a few coelacanths. Several aquariums have them. They apparently live very deep in the ocean, in the Indian Ocean. They've been discovered in Indonesia and in uh, India, and uh, off the coast of India, and off the coast of Madagascar, Africa. Mostly the Indian Ocean. I don't, I'm not aware of them being anyplace else. But the coelacanth, when they found it, and here the textbooks had been telling the kids, this is, you know, 70 million years old. Well, they found the coelacanth still alive, and the guy said, wow, look at this, one survived for 70 million years. It doesn't even enter their mind that, wait a minute, maybe your geologic column is baloney. See, they have to defend that geologic column. You don't dare question that because you'll lose your job. So instead, they'll say, wow, some survived for 70 million years. They do the same thing when they find a living dinosaur. Wow, some of them survived for 70 million years. They just don't get it. Textbook says, dinosaurs lived 70 million years ago. Oh, wait a minute. Dinosaur blood was found inside the bone. Cut open a dinosaur bone and they could still see the blood cells in there. Don't you think the blood cells would rot in less than a few million years? Video uh, number two, we have some more on dinosaurs and humans still you know, living together, of course, what we just covered in the last part. This is a biology book. Uh, let's see, I don't think I brought that one, did I? No. Campbell? No. He says, 18 million-year-old magnolia leaves from Idaho shale were still green when the rock was first cracked open. Now, what's the problem with his statement? He assumes they're 18 million years old. Truth of the matter is, probably that Idaho shale buried all sorts of things at the time of the flood. In the Reader's Digest, Mysteries of the Unexplained, there's a whole section about living toads that when you break open a lump of coal, a toad jumps out. Many stories have been told like that. In uh, France, they were blasting a tunnel through a mountain for putting a railroad line. And they broke open this huge uh, boulder of limestone and with a piece of dynamite. They stuck some dynamite in, <laughs> blasted this big rock to get it out of the way. And a pterodactyl stepped out, stretched its wings, 10 foot 9 inch wingspan, leathery skin. It squawked and died. Now how? Here they are in the middle of a mountain, solid rock. They've been blasting in this to make this tunnel. And a pterodactyl steps up. When they looked at the boulder that they just broken in half, there was a perfect impression of the pterodactyl on both sides. How would you explain that? Becky? Well, the rock cells evolved into a... Oh, rock cells evolved pterodactyls in the middle of them. Yeah, that could be. Well, I have a theory about that. During the flood, all sorts of things were buried. Many were buried alive. Now, frogs or toads, during the winter, they dig down into the mud, cover themselves up with a you know, coating of mud, and go to sleep. How long can they last? Can they hibernate five years? Ten years? 4,400 years? I don't know. But I know there are lots of stories where live toads or live lizards have come out of rock, and I'll show you the stories in Reader's Digest, uh, Strange Stories and Amazing Facts, or Mysteries of Unexplained. These stories are told in many of these books, and it gives the documentation of who it happened to. Sometimes the toads are kept alive for weeks afterwards. I think the flood's the only explanation for that. 
You get these live animals trapped in these rocks. Um, they're going to say each of the layers is a different age. Well, now, hold on just a minute. All over the world, we find petrified trees standing up. Darwin didn't like to round off the numbers, so he said uh, the Wealdon deposits in England were 306,662,400 years old. Oh, that's real good, Charlie. How do you know this now? <laughs> Explain this to me. Here's a petrified tree standing straight up. This one's in Germany, but they're found all over the world. Petrified trees standing up. Notice it's running through many different layers of rock. This is another one of the proofs that the layers of rock are not different ages. Here's a petrified tree with me standing next to it. This one's from Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. In Yellowstone, there's this place called Specimen Ridge. I was there a couple years ago when Eric graduated from the college out there. And we went to Specimen Ridge. There are petrified trees standing up. None of the trees are more than 500 years old. They have less than 500 rings. Many of them run through four or five layers above the one that they're, that they're in. Nearly all of them have roots that go out a short distance and stop. If, you, if a hurricane came through town here and knocked trees down, it would knock the tree over and pull up a root ball. Does it get all the roots out of the ground? No, it breaks them off, doesn't it? It'll break them off, you know, depending on how strong the root is, it'll break it off somewhere. And you end up with a root ball. Now, during the flood of Noah, I bet there were zillions of trees that were ripped out by the roots, floated around, and redeposited. They float along, and the water slows down, so they stop and settle to the bottom. And then a new layer of mud comes over the top, and then another layer of mud, and then pretty soon some more logs float by, and they end up getting deposited. You ended up with 27 consecutive layers of logs, of tree stumps, at Specimen Ridge, Wyoming, in Yellowstone. Now, the evolutionist will say, see, this proves the Earth is millions of years old, because what happened, the forest grew at least 500 years, then it was buried... Then new trees started to grow, and they lived at least 500 years, and then they were buried, and then new trees started to grow. So you've got to take 500 times 27 minimum, which is, what, 14,000 or uh, 13,500 years. They'll say this is a minimum of 13 or 14,000 years old. No, no, no. These stumps go, if, if one tree stump goes up through into another layer, it didn't sit there for millions of years waiting for the next layer to come. It would have rotted and fallen over by then. When a tree dies, it rots in a few years and falls over. Petrified trees that are standing up are found all over the world. There's a guy by one in uh, Joggins, Nova Scotia. Quite a few have been found there. i got some other more modern pictures. Here's one from Alabama. This uh, guy's a friend of mine up in uh, at Troy State. No, Don Patton, I don't know Don McDonald, but I know uh, uh, one of the other guys there. He said, uh, we find petrified trees in coal all the time. We're digging, he's a miner. They dig up coal seams, and you find this tree, and it extends up right out of the coal into the next layer of rock. Sometimes the top part of the tree is petrified, and the bottom part of the tree is coalified. I got a rock in the, uh, right above your desk there, Becky. Uh, uh, the, the outside is petrified, the inside is coalified. Turn to coal. Same rock. Interesting. Um, here's some from Joggins, Nova Scotia. This family uh, took these pictures for me from a uh, little kid sitting there putting her hand on a petrified tree standing up. Can you see that one? It obviously went way down. Most of the pieces have now fallen out of the cliff. But there are petrified trees standing up, running through multiple rock layers. In Germany, they're found. In France, in many parts of the United States, these petrified trees are found. In California, they find lots of petrified trees standing up, running through multiple rock layers. Sometimes the trees are upside down. The big end is on top. Now, how could this happen slowly over millions of years? Hmm. I've thought about it for a long time, and I think the evolutionists really have only two ways to solve this. Number one, they can say the trees stood there for millions of years while the dirt slowly formed around them. What would be the problem with that theory? The tree would rot. 
the tree's going to fall over. It's not going to stand there for millions of years. Or number two, the trees grew through hundreds of feet of solid rock looking for sunlight. Well, then you got the problem, who planted the seed? And how did it know there was sunlight hundreds of feet above it? The simpler solution is, the trees were buried in a big flood. See, how fast was that calf going? Keep that thought in mind, right? The flood formed all the, nearly all the layers of rock that we see in the world, and we have polystrata fossils to prove it. We'll get into more of that uh, later. This geologic column does not exist anywhere in the world except in the textbooks. But you need to understand the history of the times. In 1830, when that book came out, things were becoming pretty prosperous in the world. It was the age of industrial revolution, lots of new machines. In the old days, if you wanted to make a shirt, you had to go get the cotton, you know, spin it into thread, weave the fabric, sew the shirt. It might take you three weeks to make a shirt. Now they got machines that can make a shirt in three hours. Wow. Now instead of spinning the thread by hand, you know, with their, you know, pedaling their spinning wheels, you got a big machine to make it in a hurry. And the more machines that came on the line in the early 1800s, called the Industrial Revolution, the more prosperous things became. I mean, all of a sudden, you didn't have to work, you know, eight hours a day just to prepare food. You could do it in two hours a day. You didn't have to spend three weeks harvesting your corn. You now have a machine that'll harvest the corn in three hours. So once things, uh, it starts to allow you to get more done in a day, to make more money in your lifetime, and everything's becoming very prosperous. And so some people thought, you know, we got everything we need. We don't need God anymore. And often when times are good, people turn away from God. When times are bad, they turn to God. Some people say, boy, if God would give me a million dollars, I'd give him, I'd, I'd tithe. No, probably if God gave you a million dollars, it would ruin you. You'd end up getting away from God altogether. That's probably, and God knows that's what would happen. It does to most folks. doesn't have to, but it just seems to work that way. So, in the early 1830s, people were believing the Bible was true. The flood formed all those layers. Lyle comes along and says, no, these layers form slowly. And they started believing it, and it turned them away from the biblical worldview. And all of this had a very profound influence on a young fella named Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin went on a boat ride in 1831. The boat was called the HMS Beagle. And that boat ride, while he's sailing around, he had just graduated from Bible college. And he brought some books with him to read. One of the books he brought was Principles of Geology, written in 1830. Here it is the next year, 1831, and Darwin brings this book. That book, as he read it on that voyage, changed his life forever. And we'll talk next class about what happened to Charles Darwin in the early 1830s. Coming up next week. Thank you for joining us.